start every San Diego Media Pros pr uh, meeting with a production horror story, and sadly, they're all from my experience. Um, if you have a production horror story, please e email it to me, president at sdmediapros.org. I spoke uh, last year, I spoke last year about a, uh, a uh, experience I had taking, uh, making a commercial for a senior daycare center down in Chula Vista and uh, have, uh, using, we were using the seniors who come to the, the center and one of the, uh, one of the people in the commercial kept saying, uh, I like to sing, but the expression on her face was very flat. And I kept asking her, and she's speaking in Spanish, and so I'm asking through an interpreter, can you please smile? Can you please smile? I'd love to have a big smile. Take after take after take. Finally, the woman says through the interpreter, she has Graves disease and has no control over the muscles in her face. And I wanted to shoot myself. Last week, <laughs> last week, I'm doing another campaign for the same people, and they have, uh, uh, I wrote this cute commercial where our actor is walking through and, and talking about the great care that his dad receives uh, from the doctors and the medical staff and the the dad is walking up and he has a ice pack around his knee and the, the uh, doctor says, keep some ice on that knee and the son looks at the doctor and says, gardening mishap. And the grandpa says, the eggplant tripped me. And they laugh. <coughs> Turns out that this year they found a man who had, is recovering from a stroke. And so his face, again, does not express himself well. And so I haven't edited yet, but I'm really hoping that it comes off as just deadpan. And it may. But I'm going to put a laugh track in there if I have to. So that's uh, this month's production horror story. Again, send yours to president at sdmediapros.org. Um, welcome to uh, our meeting on getting and keeping clients and, uh, and buying airtime. Um, this, uh, as, as a freelancer, this is a, a important topic for me and I hope it's an important topic for you. Um, like us on Facebook and uh, please uh, mention San Diego Media Pros to other professionals that you know. Uh, the, the association has shown quite a bit of growth this past year, year and a half, and we are uh, continuing. The bigger we get, the more connections you make and the stronger we all get. A rising tide lifts all boats. Um, I really don't know what that analogy means, but a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, you can also uh, sign up on your phone. And you know how I found this out? I renewed tonight while we were sitting right here. Uh, I had been expired because I was a freelancer and broke, and I got a check, and so I signed up. And I did it right here, and it's easy as pie, and you can too, so if you're not a member, you can sign up. Um, signing up is easy on the MCAI website, mca-i.org. It's a uh, membership for, uh, an annual membership is $90. Uh, last year it was 80, we just, the prices just went up. Um, just to cover costs because we were not, not breaking even internationally. Um, it's still a lot less than it was a number of years ago when it was 160 and we brought the prices down. So it's inching back up, but it's nowhere near what it was before. And it's well worth it, you saw the food, you get food every month and hopefully you make connections and get income. Um, the, uh, if you have any issues with membership, please talk to Mary Ann Bates, who is sitting right back there, and she's waving, so hopefully somebody looked. Um, one of the things that's been going on with MCAI, Connie, can I call you up here? Uh, one of the things that's been going on with MCAI is their, the website got hacked last year, 
and Connie has been working like an indentured servant to put it back together, so. Yeah, hi. Um, we are moving to a new web host and a new website completely, and we have to be done by the middle of April because the old web host is going to pull the plug on our sites, all of the sites that were on this old platform that they were using, they're going to shut them all down. And I just am worried that they're going to go out of business uh, and they were going to charge us three times as much money to uh, upgrade to their newest version of their software. So we made a, a decision to move to a new platform that came uh, from some sister organizations are using the same platform. It's a group called Member Clicks. So it's specifically for member associations, nonprofits. And um, so our executive director uh, has experience, the other executive director has experience using this particular um, website as well because uh, she has other um, groups. And our partner, uh, our sister uh, organization called CMMA, which is the Communication Media Managers Association, they also use the same um, website. So we, there will be some changes and it's going to look different it's going to function a little bit differently than the website does, but we hope that it's going to actually function a lot better. It's your Find a Pro listings are going to all be all inclusive with your application and renewals, so you don't have to renew them separately. You, um, have, you'll be able to select categories instead of having to create separate listings for each one of your categories. Uh, so anybody who is an active member at this moment I ha we have moved all of your Finder Pro listings over into the database. Um, so, but if it gets expired, then it's not going to be um, moved over. You'll have to recreate it when you renew your membership. But that's going to be just fairly easy, just filling in the blanks of a of a form and stuff. So, uh, and I think that the uh, Find a Pro listings will integrate um, better into your into the San Diego um, website as well. It'll, look, it'll have a, just a nicer look than the way it is right now because we don't have the side panel and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, so please um, if, check, your, uh, check your membership online. Just go online, and, and if you need to renew, there'll be a little renew link that you can do that. Once, um, once we get to the new website, I'll have to try and figure out what you're going to see when, when, you have, when a renewal comes up because I'm not quite sure yet. Thank you. And thank you for all the hard work on the website. I know you've been working at it for months. And she's, that's a ton of work, so thank you very much. Um, this past month, they handed out uh, the MCAI Golden Reels for the MCAI Film Festival. And San Diego, uh, uh, Raymond Montemayor from Pixel Productions won either two or three he, he won, I know that he won at least two golden reels, and there are very few golden reels given out. Um, there's a, a couple other people who won silver, but the gold ones are awesome. Um, I would like to give a brief thank you, and Eddie, come on up. Thank you so much for hosting our meeting tonight. And... Please tell the folks about uh, Vision Pulse Studios. Hi there. Eddie Lane, nice to meet you. Welcome to Vision Pulse. We're closing. <laughs> Actually, we are. Um, and that's part of my, uh, my little announcement here. Little shock, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, nice, huh? Uh, actually, we've been here for 10 years, and we are an event and meeting space. We have office spaces, conference rooms in this uh, meeting space. And um, May 1st is our last day here. And i am got an eyeball on a new space that's even better. <laughs> so stay tuned. What else should I say? Oh, one of the other projects that I'm working on. Who likes to travel the world in vacation? And who needs a vacation? And who wants to film a movie while you're on vacation? Hey, there's an idea. Okay, so I'm working on a program called Filmcations, where we're going to be going on vacation and shooting some projects abroad, or of broads, but no, abroad. Um, okay, 
was a little off color. <laughs> All right, are you ready for the microphone back? Okay. All right, thanks. Welcome. At each meeting, we do tips and tricks, and I'm going to go through these to get to the actual meat of our content. Uh, the purpose of these is to make sure that you get something that you can take away from the meeting, even if you're not uh, specifically here to get something out of the speakers. Hopefully, you'll get something out of these. Um, uh, when you're writing a script, say dialogue out loud. That's when you discover how hard it is to say something. If you can't say it out loud, your actors or your performer or your spokesman won't be able to, and so you can fix it before it's a problem, before you're spending money on set. Uh, um, Pre-production, uh, schedule in time. Uh, at many locations, parking takes time, lighting takes time, wardrobe changes take time, good sound takes time. Put those things into your schedule, into your shoot schedule. Uh, directing, uh, give people the freedom to use their own words, then work backwards toward the script. Uh, sometimes you'll, people will read the script and feel like they have to say it word for word, and it won't come out right. And so if you give them the freedom to change the words, they can put it in whatever way they want, and then you can add the elements that you need to be accurate to the script back in. You'll get what you need, and you'll get a better performance. Uh, lighting. Uh, there's a type of lighting gel called shower curtain, uh, and, and uh, this, is, this was, tip was given to me by Nick Berry, who's a gaffer. Uh, it's Lee Filters 255, and it's a diffusion gel that is similar to uh, 216 or opal. Uh, if you doubled opal, it's like this stuff. Uh, but the difference is it's made out of this thin plastic stuff that doesn't ripple like opal and other lighting gels. So if you have it outdoors in the wind, uh, the wind won't make, it won't make any noise in the wind compared to other gels. You can, you can uh, put it on a light or put it on a frame and when the wind hits it, it won't make sound because it's soft like a shower curtain. Uh, camera, when shooting a green screen, put the green at 60 IRE, then light the talent to match. Um, if you have a DSLR, use the histogram and put it just above middle gray. Uh, in my experience, 60 IRE works really well because it's bright enough to separate itself from the shadows, but it's not so bright that it starts to lose color saturation. Um, doo -doo -doo. Editing. Uh, I saw, a, watched a short film for a friend of mine the other day, and there is a uh, section of a shot where she has two people in the foreground, and one of them says a punchline, and somebody at the next table reacts. And uh, she, she uh, played it for me, and she was like, I'm stuck, I can't do anything about it. I said, you know what you do? You cut out that little, you, you take that shot, you copy it, you uh, crop in on just the, the people at the next table, and then change the timing of it so you're watching 15 seconds earlier or 15 seconds later, and they won't have that reaction. So you can crop little things out of your background and change what's happening. Um, da -da -da. Uh, compositing. Uh, when you start playing with text, when you start putting text onto video, one of the things that's fun to look at, particularly in After Effects, sometimes in, in, uh, in your editing system, is to change the transfer modes. For example, if you have uh, text over water, if you just try different transfer modes, you can see how the text can blend into the water a little more interestingly. Blending modes, yes. Uh, uh, narration, do one fast and one slow. Uh, when I uh, have people cut voiceovers for me, I ask them to do one fast and one slow, and the purpose of that is, in my software, I'm able to speed something up a little bit or slow something down a little bit, but I can't do it a lot because it starts sounding like hell. If I need it sped up a lot, then I can have a separate cut. Uh, and Mike Tao wants to add something right now, yes? 
Yes, please. The software he's talking about is Final Cut 10. And what I'm going to add is I just recently had to do three and a half hours of paddy diving certification in French, Spanish, Dutch, and Italian. And in all of those languages, with the exception of Dutch, they're all a hell of a lot longer than English. Um, and the ability to speed up audio in Final Cut 10 was amazing. But the key is, it does it on a percentage. And what that means is the longer chunk of audio that you can speed up, the more you're going to be able to speed it up. Um, the, on the Spanish, we were able, since they did the, the whole, like 50 minutes was our longest chunk, they did the whole thing as one audio take, we were able to actually speed up that whole take 118% before it started sounding chipmunky. So the, the key is the bigger the chunk, the more you can speed it up. But Final Cut 10 is really amazing at speeding up audio. That's it. What do you mean? Since it's a percentage, if you, if you do 120% of an hour, it's not going to get as fast as 120% of 10 seconds. That's gonna be faster. Right, so that's going to sound chipmunky quicker. So the longer the chunk, the more you can speed it up. Um, the shorter the chunk, the less you can. With with you know, a lot of times shorter chunks, like maybe 30 seconds, we were maybe able to get 108, 109 percent. But with that full one, we were up to 118 percent before before the interpreter said, "No, that sounds too weird." Um, so, and, and I've never been able to speed anything up that much before in any other software. No, with with Final Cut 10, you can basically take the audio channel and you can do it on video too, and just do a speed change to it. And then by doing the speed change. You can grab, you can basically ex shorten or extend the clip, um, and by shortening or extending it, it speeds it up a certain percentage or slows it down a certain percentage. And speaking of slowing down, we weren't able to slow down as much as we could speed up. Slowing down got goofy, got sounding bad quicker than speeding up did. So that's what you get. How fast? Take it a slow day. Yeah. And the other thing I learned for all of you voiceover talent in here, and I know Connie already does this, please take out your breaths. I had, I had one lady that was like every, it was constantly, <gasps> and it was just like we spent an hour, well, a couple hours just going in and, you know, reducing, killing, getting rid of all of these just outrageous breaths. Yeah. Yay, thank you. And the last little tip here I have is for exporting. When I export, I make local TV commercials. And when I export TV commercials, uh, I shoot at 2398, uh, broadcast once, spots at 2997. Well, my first step is to export that 2398 uh, master in 2398. I get a master in 2398. I add a broadcast uh, filter. Uh, to make sure that it's within broadcast specs, and then I uh, export as high an H.264 as I can, and then I take that and, uh, or I exp export a ProRes, um, but either way, as high quality as I can, and then I use that to export uh, uh, 2997 for broadcast. Uh, the I don't know why they insist on 2997 when the TVs can can. Do it on the fly. No, because it's 23976, which when extrapolated out ends up being 2997. So it's, it's identical because math. <laughs> uh, all right. Why would I shoot in 2398? Good question. Um, because 
when you shoot in 2398, 2398, it has a different feel to it. And I recommend you, you try doing this at home. Uh, figure out a shot that has a little bit of movement to it, a little bit of, you know, fluidity to it. Uh, when you watch uh, 2997 playback, it's going to be choppy and quick. When you watch 30p playback, it's going to be smoother. When you watch 2398, it's going to have uh, additional fields that get, get uh, in, uh, overlapped in the pull down, which smooths that motion. So it ends up looking, uh, film cameras were at 24. When they transferred film to video, it was going from 24 to 2997, and so it added those fields with the 3 2 pull down. And so traditionally, our eye sees film a certain way, and that's what 2398 does. All right. Yes, yes, it's like a built-in Gaussian blur, yes. All right, so let's get to our meeting. Yay! Um, I'm going to introduce Tom Kinneman, who is, has organized this meeting for us. And, and you're all alone. Okay, Tom, come on up. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Marianne and I. We put this together over the last uh, couple, three months. Um, there's been a call for wanting to know more about media buying, and then once you get in business, how do you keep your business going? So we have two excellent speakers here tonight to help us get to know more of that. Um, we'll uh, have Rod Hunter up first, and Rod started in radio, um, number one rated uh, DJ, and as you find yourself in that position, everybody wants you to do your radio commercials, wants you to do your commercials. So he found his way uh, into advertising and uh, primetime um, advertising, primetime media group has been going for 30 years or more. And um, Rod has been buying um, media and negotiating media for um, all of that time. Um, one thing I want to put out real quick, start putting your thinking cap on about questions. Um, Rod and then uh, Brian going to give a, a brief overview, if you will. But this is all about back and forth. Let's get some questions going so we, so we can get some of our, uh, of our uh, questions answered, OK? So with that, I'll introduce Rod Hunter. Tom has been an editor of mine for 20 22, 23 years, forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back when linear was fun. Uh, in radio, it seems like uh, the NFL people go into insurance sales and radio people go into media buying or television. So it's just a, a natural step. When Tom asked me to do a little thing on media buying, I said, that's a really big room. So rather than, and I am a little nervous because I've never done a presentation where I'm not prepared. Because I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'll just say this, this, and this, and then you guys can take me wherever you want to take me. If I don't know the answer, I'll just say I don't know. But why try to tell you stuff that you don't care about? So let's go ahead and start with this. First, you have a client, a product, and a target. The more you know about your client's product, the better you're going to be able to hit the target, which is a consumer. So in media buying, what your job to do is, is to convince the person that you're working with that you know enough about media to be able to buy his media time. So if you don't know his product, you're not, it's not going to happen. What kind of, what, what, what's the product? It's Chevy. Okay, well, Chevy is a broad product, 25 to 54. That's a nice age group. But what kind of Chevy? I buy a lot different when I'm 18 than when I do when I'm 54. So me as a media buyer, I'm not going to take a 25 to 54 and say, oh, okay, that's my target. My target is 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54. It goes in nine-year age, nine age groups, not 25, 54. Does Chevy fit in there? Oh, yeah. What kind of Chevy? Corvette. Why doesn't Chevrolet advertise Corvettes? Because they don't have to. I wanted one since I was 18. They know when I'm 60, I'm going to buy one. That's why you have all the Q-tips in Corvettes. You, you can't buy Corvette commercials on a radio station that's broadcasting to 18 to 24-year-old young men. 
They're not going to be able to afford it, so don't bother wasting your client's money. So I put this up here because numbers in media buying are so confusing. People think it's such a, 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 a you know, an enigma, and it's really not. This is uh, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just a, an overview of some Nielsen overnights. So what it says here is households have an 8.3 household rating on Walking Dead, and you just followed the little numbers down. Well, that really won't mean anything to your client, but this is the way we look at it. Now, if I want adults 25 to 54, notice some of the programming changes just a little bit in numbers. What the, oh, by the way, what the, what the household number, what, what this means is an 8.3 rating is of the people in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania who have a television set, 8.3% watch that program. Now, you might end up with an 8.3 at a 15 share, which means a share is simply what percentage of people who have TVs in that market actually are watching that program. So, but you can't get all caught up in the numbers. You have to be careful because right now, okay, adults 25 to 54, you see the way they, they're doing it. If I can get my, there we go. Now, if I want women 25, 54, there's the programming I want to buy on cable. If I want men 25, 54, that's what I want to buy on cable. But the real trick in media buying is kind of a, this is kind of a thing that I've done all my, in all my years, is I'll look at a TV station or a radio station's ratings. I'm number one, 2554, somewhere. I guarantee every station in your market is going to be number one in the little niche somewhere. So what I do is I look, the, I take my nine-year groups, 1824, 2534, 3544, and I look in there and I see where they're the weakest. Then I call that station and say, I'm looking for 18 to 24-year-old uh, adults. Well, gee, uh, the, the point is, is you want to tell them you want their weakest spot because they're going to be able to charge you less because you're not going to want anything else. So it's just a little game we play. But if you want to uh, win the game money-wise for your client, you have to be smarter than the TV or radio station that you're, you're sitting there talking to. So how do I get a hold of a television or radio station? Nowadays, there used to be an SRDS, Standard Rate and Data, which we don't use anymore. You just go online. You can get, if, if your market's in Houston, Texas, you go to Houston, Texas and go ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox. And is it easier to buy nowadays? And, and you, by the way, you just call the sales department. But when you do that, you have to be a little bit on, a little edgy, because if you come off like you don't know what you're talking about, they're going to sell it to you for 30 bucks when you could have got it for 15. You just have to know how to approach them and with, with what your product is and do a little research first. Their ratings are online. You can find out everything about them before you ever make the phone call. After you make the phone call, hit their weakest link and tell them that's the age group you're after. They go, well, gee, we're number one here. Well, that's not that, but I want this. And never mind then. And you just play this little negotiating game and you end up getting it. What you really want at the end of the day is their political rate. Because a political rate means if they give you a rate that is a political rate, the politicians, or if, if, if they give you a $10 rate and their average rate's 20, then any politician can call up and get a $10 rate. Now, he's got a $10 rate because you said it. Well, so the stations don't want to go below their political rate. But once you get to it, you'll never get it lower, and that's the one you're looking for. So in rating, when you're, when you're negotiating, uh, I can't really say there's any one specific way to do it. You're going to have to figure it out. That's more of a sales game than it is a media buying game. But it's played by you and the TV stations. Okay, so yo, please interrupt any time. What? Um. Well, the rates are based on what show. You're explaining it a little bit on placement because okay. if you're talking about their weakest group, they might go, oh, well, we're going to put you in this weakest show that we have where it might be just the same as like the strongest show that they have. And the same thing with the political. Is that running the dial? Because they, you know, prime time is totally different than fringe, different Certainly. Than daytime. Certainly. Okay, let's talk about a very good question. In, if you look at your client and you go, uh, uh, the Voice has a 10.8 rating. He's going to go, I don't know what that means. So the trick for you is to, conv or is to take everything that you buy, radio, TV, newspaper, billboards, print, anything, and break it down to cost per thousand. I don't care what the rating is. I want to know how many thousands of people are listening to this radio station at 9.15. 
AQH, average quarter hour, that's a, that's a uh, it, it, every 15 minutes they rate it. So how many thousands of people are listening? Well, if I have a rating over here and a thousand over here and a share over there, I can't do apples to apples. So I take my television and I say, I want your cost per thousand. Age, age group, whatever it is. On, on a particular show, I'm not talking about 24 hours. It's on The Voice, I want to know what your cost per thousand is. Now, if I get that on TV, I do the same with radio. And your cost per thousand is 10 bucks, okay? Then when you put all your radio stations in a group and you look at it, you go, well, this station's charging $18 a thousand. This one's only charging six. Everybody's over here, but this guy's way up there. You either eliminate him or tell him he has a chance to lower his rate. But once they once they have the co- once you have the cost per thousand, you can put your TV with your radio with your newspaper. And I'll tell you right now, the worst, most inefficient buy you can do that I buy all the time is cable, because your cost per thousand is about two hundred and seventy-seven bucks. I can buy prime time for eighteen. So why am I buying cable? It's called reach and frequency. I want to re- reach is how many people you hit. Frequency is how many times you hit them. So I buy 25% reach and about 75% frequency. When I buy the frequency, cable plays a big part in that. And they're very targetable. I can target cable in zones where I can't target broadcast in zones because broadcast is broadcast. Does that help? Thousand, the cost per thousand is just the most crucial thing you can do. And then you can put all your TV and your radio in a line and go, this person's out of line, this person's out of line, everybody else is okay. And you, hit me with it. What do you got? So it was 75% reach and 25 frequency? No, it was the other way around. I, I, I buy 25. Well, see, you can't afford to buy too much frequency because a newscast is going to cost you about 14 or 1500 bucks. I just got the voice in Erie, Pennsylvania today on a fire sale for $300 when actually it's about a, well, they never sell it for under five. You can turn that out if you want. So if, if, they, sell it for, if they sell it for five every day, I got a call today from my rep and said, hey, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll lower, because see, airtime is intangible. They can't resell it once it's gone. So if a program has a hole in it and you're a friend enough to the rep, they're going to call you and go, hey, Rod, I got this really good deal. I don't want to see it go away, but I'll give it to you for 300 bucks. Everybody else just paid five, you paid three. So when you negotiate, you don't want to do it on an edge where you're pissing them off. You want to become their friend over time. Because once you're, they're your friend, they're going to call you with the fire sales that you're looking for for your client. So I got a 6 to 6.30 uh, Simpsons and a voice on Monday night at 9.29 p.m. in Erie, Pennsylvania for 300 bucks. Um, where's my... I told you, when you're not prepared, you get nervous. <laughs> but I know half of you, so it shouldn't be. Questions, hit me. What you got? Yeah. Uh, business things you have to do to become an agency. Is there any... any File a business license, basically. There's two things I want. Somebody remind me. Pandora and commissions. Don't let me forget those two things. Um, not really. You just, you just get a business license and you're an agency. Um, you need good credit because you're going to place... 40 or 50 grand for a client that now, now let me back up a second. I'm in, I do primarily car stores all over the country. So these guys spend an enormous amount of money. In Houston, Texas, we had a Kia store, Tom knows Kia and a Houston and a, and a Chevy store spent $120,000 a month with us plus production. That's just on the air. So they spend a lot of money. So I'm going to, I'm going to cover commission while I'm, while I'm standing here. An issue with you and a client is going to be when he finds out you're making 15% commission. But the broadcast world is set up that way. When they get a bill, when you get a bill from a broadcast station, if you spent 10 bucks, you owe them 850. You get to get 15 percent. Well, the dealer sees, okay, I spent 100 grand and you only paid them 85. You made 15,000 dollars. But it's not of his money. You, what you did was got him a better rate than he could have got. If it, what I tell a dealer when I get a new dealer is I say, if you're spending $100 a spot, I'll get the same spot for 100 or under, and I'll be paid in that, or there's no sense in us doing business. So I get the same spot for 100 Yeah, I'm only going to pay 85 for it, and I keep 15 but I'll let him know that up front. But it's not 15% on top of your media bill. It's 15%. Why did stations want to pay me 15%? Because I'm going to keep him from being a turn signal. On, he's off, he's on, he's off. If they're going to 
do enough to hire someone like me to do their stuff. I'm going to keep him on the air. Tom knows we've had dealers on the air for 15 years. I've been doing La Mesa RV since 1982. That's a long time. And I'm looking like it. I'm getting a face for radio, which is why I'm going to bother. I'm not going to use my green screen anymore. <laughs> okay. What else you got? Oh, uh, Pandora. Pandora radio for your clients would be a wonderful way to target. Because first of all, they have a huge click-through to websites. Second, you can target anything you want, 20-mile radius. You can do uh, uh, males only, females only. You can do Hispanics only. You can, because people program, you, you, you all, have, not you all, because I don't, but most of you probably have heard of or use Pandora. So every, they only do four minutes an hour. And you can, if you do mobile only, you can do what's called an island spot, which is surrounded by music. So you play your, your favorite station that you programmed, playing your music, and boom, on comes a spot, and boom, you're back to music again. But you can, like I say, as, as, as a client that you would have, you can target a 20-mile radius from his store, age 18 to 34, males only. Bingo. Spend $2,000 a month, and you're rocking. We have, uh, we get like 40,000 impressions, maybe 10,000 click-throughs. Um, this is in, where, what market did I just see that in? Um, pardon me? Impressions, we get like, for, for that money, you'll get about 40,000 impressions a week. For how much? For about two grand. Yeah. And again, it depends on market. It depends on how you target it, too. For everything you, because if you slim it down so far, obviously, you're going to run out of people. So if you say, I only want 18-year-old males who chew bubble gum on Friday nights in Cincinnati, well, there are not going to be but three of those. So you're only going to be able to spend eight bucks. So you understand how that works. The broader your uh, limitations are or the broader your uh, desires are, uh, the, the, the more people you're going to hit. So Pandora is wonderful. It's, it's not expensive. And people pay attention, and they get a lot of click-throughs to their website. They can Google that, or they can go on the back end of their website uh, and in an analytics and see how many people are coming from Pandora. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Eddie, what's up? I'll run that. My life's right now. Well, look at all your tan. It's already working for it. Tan. What's up? Um, online media, like a uh, YouTube buy or something. Yeah. There, yeah. We do pre-rolls, uh, YouTube video pre-rolls. The difference between Pandora and YouTube pre-roll is people, like YouTube serves up their searches two ways, with product or with interest. If you want to go on YouTube and see Tiger Woods, you're going to get him only. Or you can do golf, which is an interest. So they serve it up both ways. So what you want to do, in, or what we do with our pre-rolls, oh, wait, wait, where was I headed here? Um, yeah, Pandora versus the YouTube. People don't want to go there to see anything other than Tiger Woods. So you're an intrusion to them. That beginning spot is just, you know, I don't want to see that. I want to see just Tiger. So five seconds into it, you can skip it and go right to your video. But that's an impression. You only pay for full views. So if you're running a 15-second spot or a 30, you're only going to pay $0.07 cents if they saw the whole thing or whatever the amount is in, in the market that you're in. Is there a different rate for the ones where you can't click through? Because there's some, some... I don't know the answer to that. But you're right. I've seen some that don't say skip, but rarely. And I, I honestly just don't know. The question was, is there a different rate for a spot that you can't skip? I don't know the answer. Jeez! How's that work? I don't know. How does it work in terms of you getting it uh, to the website and you getting billed? Very easy. It's simple. YouTube is, I do it from my office. You just go online, you log on, you put the spot up on their website, they charge your American Express card. You pay up front as you go. Uh, ours is in $500 increments. Every time we hit 500 bucks, they just hit my American Express card. And then when I get, I, I you know, I bill my client for that, and I take 15%. Again, how does the money work if there's $500 of yours that they have? How, how are they going to be taking that? They charge you X amount of cents per full view. When, whether it's 
40,000 views or 10,000 views, it, you bid. You also can, you know, yeah, I, I want to spend this much money. So you'll get, you'll get more hits than somebody else will. Yeah, just use it until you, you know, at 7 cents a piece, 10 cents a piece, 30 cents a piece. When your 500 bucks is gone, they hit you for another. And you can put it up and take it down the same day. I mean, you don't have to run it. You can run three days a week, one day a week, seven days a week, run it any time you want. And you can do it from your own computer at home. You just have to have the product to put up there. So you manage the entire thing. You don't really even talk to a rep. No. Don't talk to nobody. You just go online. With I'm sorry. No, I don't advertise on Facebook. Uh, I personally, Tom, no, my, I... I just, uh, my company has a Facebook, I do not. I don't want people to know what I had for lunch, where I went to the bathroom, and how far I am from home. You know, it doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, YouTube is, we get, we get a ton of impressions, very few click-throughs, because most people don't watch the whole spot to click through. They don't want to watch that spot. They wanted to watch Tiger Woods or motorcycle racing or whatever they went to. So the impressions is good. It's kind of like TV, but you don't get any click-throughs. Or you, you do, but it's about 1% to 2% if you're lucky. It's not a lot. So out of 40,000, 40, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, I'm done, right? What are the click-throughs that you get on Pandora approximately? What is the what? What's the percentage click-through rate on uh, a percentage rate on Pandora. Um, maybe eight, maybe about eight. Yes. On YouTube, um, YouTube is almost like free in a way unless they watch the entire spot. Correct. That's why you get so many impressions with so few click-throughs. So it's actually good. Correct. The first five seconds, I want to hear Alexander Ford three times. You know. <laughs> it's hard to measure, but yes. I mean, it, again, it's a branding thing rather than a let's sell a car thing or let's sell the product thing. It's basically is branding. Get the name out. Name out. In most of my TV spots, I have the name out before I, before five seconds goes by. Yeah. Uh, uh, question. more questions, then I will get Brian. So once you've done the buy and you've delivered the spot, if I'm your client and I come back and I say, okay, what did I get for those spots? How do you then prove to me that I got value out of your spot? I can't prove to you that you got value, but I can prove to you what ran. I have analytics to show you what happened, but whether you sold anything or not, is you prove that to me. You're the client. How did it work out for you? If you didn't like it, we'll go to something different. But you can show, if you promise to deliver X amount of eyeballs, or do you promise to deliver X amount of eyeballs, can you then show that you delivered that? Yes, I can, I can promise it, and I can show it, and I can deliver it. But I can't make them come to your store. It's just branding. Analytics. There's Google Analytics that'll show it. YouTube has it. That is Google. They own it. So yeah, analytics. I can I can watch every day to tell you how many how many uh, uh, views I got or how many click throughs I get every day. What about TV spots? What's the question? How do you how do you show what you delivered on TV spots? Again, what what. How many people show up on your lot is what it delivered, but did it run? Yes. And how good was my creative? If nobody showed up, not good enough. Next, I'm out of here. You know. Uh, again. I know. I know what you're asking. Let's let's put that to the to the end. Okay. If you don't mind. Um, let's uh, give Brian a chance. Uh, you need to uh, yeah. put your, <coughs> your computer in there, Brian. Yep. Uh, I can unplug <coughs> mine. Yeah, I'm a little bit, a little sorry that uh, media buying is, 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 like I said, a very big room. There's so many places I wanted to, to talk about, but there's a, in a half an hour or whatever it is, there's not enough time. But I'm done. Bye. You're not done. We'll have lots of questions for you. Um, 
the, um, the way that you follow up, I think that one of the most important things when you're buying media for your customer is how you follow up with them. And this starts to answer your question, is that there, you do get feedback from the station, you do get make goods, you do get qualified numbers. I bought this many ratings, I didn't get this many ratings. They will come back and do make goods for you and start to bonus you. Post analysis is very important. You get all the billing and you make sure everything that you bought ran. If it didn't run, you get make goods. I've gotten free spots in the Super Bowl from doing post analysis good enough to make sure that all the spots run. Well, what can I do to make you happy? The spot didn't run. Well, I paid for it, yeah, but it didn't run. Okay, great. And you just go back and forth and fight on it. But it's post analysis, get, you make sure you get what you paid for. And if you, if you buy a couch and you go to pick it up and doesn't have an arm, it's been damaged. You want something for that. Yeah, because nobody wants a, whatever. Nobody it's wants a couch without an arm. All right. Next on the hip parade is Brian Douglas. Now, Brian, when did you found um, uh, Digital Outpost? In 1996. The man has been um, in business for a good amount of time, growing his business. It's a very secure um, uh, company for him and a lot of people. And you've got to be very proud about people you've put the work through the years. And that's got to be a big part of keeping a business running. And I'll let Brian fill in the rest of the words. Brian Douglas. Hey, hello. So uh, I was going to continue uh, Mike's story, uh, some tips. You know, He said something about shower curtain, the, the gel. Well, I have a little story on that. We were shooting out at uh, Fort Irwin out in the middle of Death Valley for the uh, Marine Corps. And the general, we were, we were, we were going to shoot on green screen back at the, uh, the, the main base and at the PA public affairs office, and everything was fine. And that uh, evening before our, our shoot the next morning, he said, uh, you know, we're, I don't want to shoot in the studio. I want to shoot out in the middle of the desert. All we had, we had its indoor lights. That's all we had. We had all plug-in lights. So we went to Home Depot and, uh, and uh, what was it? Barstow, bought a shower curtain, a real shower curtain, the opaque uh, rubber feel, made a, made a 10 by 10 frame for it and stuck it in front of the sun. And that was our key light. And it actually worked. So that was my, my one tip for the day. So. And horror stories. Horror, I got a horror story for you. Okay, horror stories. Uh, we do uh, uh, law enforcement training for all of California police officers. Okay, so we do probably 10 to 12 hour and a half, two hour documentary pieces for credit for every law enforcement officer in California. And wonderful Reagan right here is our lead producer for all of our, our post shows. And uh, we were doing a show uh, for, uh, was it elderly, I think Alzheimer's or something like that, how all law enforcement officers deal with that. And we hired a talent uh, to, uh, work, you know, be the elderly woman to, to be, you know, and through an agent and everything. And we get through the shoot, and, and she's, you know, she's, uh, she leaves the shoot, and everything's fine, and I lost my wallet. You stole my wallet. Oh, everybody. Do you remember that? You don't remember that? I don't think you were that, that one. Well, she, she had a bit of dementia, and we didn't know that. Yeah, she thought we lost. She was, he found it. He eventually found it. But our whole crew got accused of stealing something, and it was oh, it was awful. But you never know who you're going to work with, right? Yeah, I guess so. But uh, so, anyways, um, I'm going to talk about uh, keeping clients, and uh, you know, over almost 20 years now, we've been doing uh, doing this in San Diego. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Hunter and I go back a little ways. I was just informing him today. Uh, him and I worked together in 1990, actually at World Video Productions of all places. <laughs> Roman Yurima. And so uh, well, I had to go back in my memory for that one. But uh, uh, so anyways, I, I learned, well, back then in World Video, I learned how not to run a company. So... <laughs> 
So, uh, so this is my, um, I actually got this off the web. I, I made this quickly this morning, so there's not, it's not really shi you know, shiny, lots of good graphics. I just put it together real quick. Um, every customer has a lifespan. Every single one. They could be one job. They could be 20 years. It all depends on uh, how you treat them, and I'm going to get into some of the things that I do to help you with that. And uh, this graph here is a, a standard deviation curve. You know, uh, you come in, you get an acquisition, you get a new customer. Uh, it's, everything's exciting. You meet them for the first time. They love your work, and you, you engage them, and then you start doing work for them. And then you eventually you peek out, you do a bunch of work, and all of a sudden, they start finding that uh, they can get a video down the street here for half the price. And, uh, you know, they start kind of losing some business, and eventually you lose the customer. And, and it, in my 20, almost 20 years of running this company, every customer has a life. I've had customers for 10 years. I've had customers for all 19 years that I've been working. I've had customers for, you know, a month. It all depends on um, one key factor, and I'll get to that. And that's basically, it's trust. That is what it all boils down to. So the key to keeping a customer happy over a long period of time, so you have customer life there on the bottom, you see that in that box, that's where you want to stay. Okay, you want to stay in that box as long as you can stay there. Okay, so if you have, you know, you have a new customer and, and you come to a regular customer, you want to constantly engage them with new things, new ideas. Um, you want to be an advocate for their product. You want to become friends with you know, them. You want to help them and so you're a trusted source. So this is kind of the, the key where you need to, to live in because once you get over the downward migration, you can pretty much write it. It's going to be hard to save. Once you start get someone else is looking elsewhere, it's going to be hard to get that client back engaged. Unless it's all based on price at that point. Um, so these are some of my tips about staying engaged. Um, all, one of the things I've learned, I'm on a couple nonprofit boards here in San Diego, and I, I, um, I've learned this over the years. You can't gain someone's trust in one meeting. You can't do it. It usually takes about six to seven really good, close meetings, working with somebody for them to gain trust in you. You want to be interested and have their client's best interest always in your, at heart, okay? Introduce new technologies, products, and services. I'll kind of show you what we do. Um, our longest standing customer is the U.S. Army, okay? We do all of the recruiting videos for the U.S. Army that are not on television. So, Every recruiter, um, and we've had to migrate them from me taking pictures on, on a base in 1998 to what we're doing today. And I'll show you a couple examples of what we're doing today. Uh, position yourself as a trusted expert. That just takes time. And you have to always give them help, tips, um, uh, to so that they're all, your client thinks you're thinking of them a lot. And you, it's easy to do now with email and, and tips you can find off, the, off of uh, certain news sites or video websites. And it's good to always stay on top of that. Uh, the two most important things, always keep your word. Your word is everything. And you always over-deliver. That is, that, is, that, is the, that is the key thing to keep in a customer. Uh, that's, I do that with everything I do. Um, and the, the final thing is I wanted to pass this on to you. I, I, uh, worked a, I work at a conference. We, one of our clients is a Servant Leadership Institute here in Carlsbad. And uh, we've been doing it five years, and we capture all their, their, con their conference content. Well, I just saw Stephen M. R. Covey speak this last week. Incre incredible. Okay? If you want to learn about successful business, he has a thing called the speed of trust. This is really, really uh, important. He is an amazing speaker. Uh, he, imagine there's high trust and there's low trust. If you have a high trust in somebody, 
you're not going to worry that they're not they're going to come they're going to cost you they're going to sue you or you're going to you're going to have to spend all this money on legal fees and and, and contract fees and trying trying to get, you you, tr you trust them you're going to get it done it's it's finished if you have low trust you end, uh, and you enter into a business relationship your attorneys have to look at all the contracts and everybody has to you know spend all this money and everything and and your trust is based on uh, you know not your word or your or your personality or your interest and trust it's based on a contract. And the long, the, my point is, if, you're, if your client's based solely on a contract and not based on trust, it'll, that, that curve will be much shorter. If it's trust, it'll be a long time because they'll always trust in you to do the right thing. So he told a story on this last conference last month when, he was, when I saw him. He said that uh, uh, the CEO of Frito-Lay and the CEO of Taco Bell were friends and they got together and they've been longtime friends and they decided, um, you know, let's do something together. Let's make, a, you know, let's something where we can bring, you know, nacho cheese Doritos and, and uh, Taco Bell tacos together, okay? Hundreds of millions of dollars later, they did that on a handshake. They didn't do it with the, with the contract or writing a, a, what the percentages will be or, you know, they, but they did have a, uh, in their agreement that if any one of them ever moved on or did something else, then they would have to write a contract. And so they did that. If they would have done that, if they would have tried to do the deal w without this handshake, then it would have taken years to write the contract, and they would have never got it off the ground. So that's the speed of trust. So I, I just want to say that's, that's a very important thing that you should um, to look into. It's a, it's a great book, by the way. Okay, so... Um, I took a, one of our clients, the Army. We started in 98. This is the migration of all the services that I've had to add to my company to keep them as a customer. So we started, you know, my, my, my partners and I, we were um, all technical techie geeks out of a company called GTE, Interactive Media. And we started there in, um, I'd say, about 95 or so. And we did video games, and we did video compression, and, and uh, I was the broadcast engineer for the, for the office. And uh, we were really, really good. For, GTE is now Verizon, by the way, so just a big phone company. And GTE at the time said, okay, you know, we're going to uh, lay all you guys off because there's not a future for video on the Internet. So there was, because the Internet was just starting, you know, so we t the four of us took all the assets, uh, cashed out all of our stock, and didn't get paid for two years and, <laughs> and started the company and, t and bought out the assets. So we were really good at compression. And so we started off with GoArmy.com as first launch. We did all the video compression and they loved us and it was great. That's all we did. I didn't do production. I didn't, we didn't need to. We were so busy with video. It was the beginning, the beginning of the internet. Everybody wanted video on a website. So we were pretty much one of three companies in the entire country that could do it. So as the, as Video compression became more of a commodity and things people could do with themselves. And they're like, well, what else can you do, Brian? Well, I'm a photographer. I can take pictures for you. So for your website. So we went and remember QuickTime VR? Anybody remember QuickTime VR? Well, that we did QuickTime VR tours of all these army bases around the country. So I traveled around with my little Nikon, this little tiny camera with my big wide lens on it, and did little virtual tours. And... Uh, then, they, then that kind of got old, and they said, well, what else are you going to do for us? The next phase, oh, we can do production. We, can, we got, uh, I got, a, I got a, um, a digital beta cam camera that we got from GTE that from our sale, and we bought them. I got a really high-end, you know, 720 by 480 camera with a, with a good lens on it. And they said, okay, let's, let's have you do that. So we went and did uh, MOS video productions, and the MOS is um, Military Occupational Service. It's all the jobs. And that uh, every job in the Army, there's 180 of them right now, and they all need a video. So that's kind of what I do for them. Um, as we did video for, the, uh, for a month, we, we built a video database. Because we're good at programming and compression and video, we put it all together and made them a searchable database. They love that. So then, uh, then DVD came around. Well, we, we were the first DVD house in San Diego. So we started doing their DVDs. Uh, then we moved into HD production, continuing on from the video production, moved into Blu-ray because we were the, pretty much the only Blu-ray house to do it. And then um, now we've, the last three are pretty much current. 
Uh, we've gotten, uh, still doing MOS productions, but we do a lot of real life documentary pieces. That's kind of where things are going for the Army. They want to see real stories about real people. And, uh, uh, and the other thing is infographics. I never did, I mean, I did graphics for people, you know, and some hired a 3D animator for some things, but I've never put together a whole infographic type of thing that's kind of the, the fad for, for showing quick videos about a short topic. And then uh, we moved into, we put all the, we, we recently got a contract last year to put all those videos on a smartphone. And so now uh, every recruiter, we have, we host, we have a cloud service we built. Every recruiter can search all the videos that we make for them on their smartphone and, and show it to a recruiter live off of 3G connectivity. And so that was an, a, another thing that kind of they wanted to do when we did it. And so uh, the next thing was mobile application development and cloud services. So this is over since 1998 to now. That's what I've had to do to keep this customer in that box. That's what I've had to do. No. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, when you work with the government, uh, it's always on a downslope <laughs> because every year they're always cutting. Um, so you expand your services and you get more work doing other things. That's how you work with the government. There are contracts, and there uh, that's part of my uh, that's part of what I've learned over the years how to co how to contract. That's a whole other topic. Um, but. Uh, you can contract with other companies. You contract directly with a GSA schedule. You can, there's a lot of different ways. I don't really want to get into that tonight, but um, it took me about five years to learn how to do that. So once I learned how to do it, it's pretty straightforward now. So I want to show you a couple examples. Um, I won't play the whole thing, but this is something we just finished and launched this, this uh, two weeks ago. The first day, it had 45,000 views. So that was a, it was a, it's, called, it's basically a, every year, you know, every time they change a uniform, this year they're going to change uniforms again, <laughs> they have to do new videos. So it's kind of a repetitive contract. And uh, this is about basic training. And they didn't have an actual accurate basic training video that they could call their own. So this is the example. Oops. You got some? <laughs> The transition from citizen to soldier is many things. A challenge, an adventure, a test. It's a series of questions with the answers all coming from within. The men and women who undertake that transformation, who choose to join the United States Army, do so for their own reasons. But one thing is the same for every recruit who steps off the bus at basic training. Over the next 10 weeks, they will find themselves challenged in ways that they could never fully anticipate. Whew, yesterday, that's my first time on a plane. It's just busy. That's the one word I can use for it, busy. Last night at the airport, when the drill sergeant got there, I was like, oh, it's getting real now. As soon as I got here, I was, I mean, I was terrified. I mean, I'm actually in an Army boot camp. I chose to join the Army because I felt it was necessary to serve my country. Most of my friends, they're going to go to college, they're going to be in debt for who knows how long, and I know that I already have a set job. I know what I want in life, and I know that the military is going to get me there, so just stay motivated and get the job done. Basic training begins with arrival at reception battalion. Essential paperwork is completed. Medical checks and vaccinations are given. Trainees get haircuts and uniforms and begin to look like the soldiers they're destined to become. When I was on the bus, I was sitting there like, this is going to be amazing and it's going to suck at the same time. When we arrived at basic training, he said, get off my bus. And I, my heart dropped to my stomach like, oh man, this is going down. This is, this is it. They next move into red phase. 
where they meet what will be their biggest source of guidance over the next few months, the drill sergeants. Yes, drill sergeant. Trainees start to learn the fundamentals of being a soldier, building confidence in themselves, and learning what it truly means to be part of a team. Now that I'm here and I'm experiencing it, I love it. When you hear someone calling you a soldier, you want to act like a soldier, you want to walk like a soldier, you want to talk like a soldier. I mean, I'm feeling a soldier more and more every day just because like, you're getting adapted to the routine every day, so you're getting used to like how everything's supposed to work, how, what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. I want to make it through graduation, and I'm going to do everything I can in order to do that. Training continues with white phase, where even more emphasis is placed. So the, the goal here was to demystify uh, basic training. And you can't really do that in a 30-second commercial on a, a Super Bowl or on a NASCAR event. Uh, so these are the kind of shows that we said, yeah, we can do this. I had not done anything like this <laughs> in a long time. So uh, you know, luckily, uh, I have a very talented staff, a very talented group of people that uh, are our, our vendors that I have trusted and worked with over, you know, over 20 years. And I know what I'm going to get. And so... Uh, when we send out a crew to do this, I know exactly where we're, you know, where we're going with it. This was three shoots over 10 weeks. We went back three times and followed the same soldiers all the way through from beginning to end. And uh, now we're going back this summer, and we're, going, we're taking them all to their homes, interviewing their, their families, their influencers, their, and then also we're going to go to their workplace and show them doing their job. And then we're going to tie up with this program. This is uh, Fort Jackson. That's at Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina, and Fort Benning in, in Georgia. And it was all shot last August in Georgia and South Carolina. Yeah, it was, we sweat a lot. Yeah. This, is, uh, this one's six minutes. So it's on, the, it's on their YouTube channel. It's on the U.S. Army Recruiting Camp YouTube channel if you want to watch the whole thing. So... <laughs> But, you know, I just we keep going here. Um, so that's one of the things we had to build. We hadn't built a documentary-style show for them. They said, Brian, can you do this? Sure. You know, I'm, I'm, I've always had the mentality of if you want uh, get a phone call. Okay, do you pour cement driveways? Yes. My next call is where do I buy cement? And, what, you know, where do I find an expert to, that I know? All right? That gets you back to the speed of trust. Wouldn't it be great if everything you did in life, you had a person for? You know, like, like you know, my, my, I need my brakes done. I got a guy for that, right? I got a guy for that. Well, if you, have the, if you have trust and the speed of trust in your life, that's what you start building. You start getting relationships and you start getting people. You know people. You, you, you trust people. And that, that's what we don't have. We have a lot of low trust in society today. And so that's what I, it all boils back to that. That's my, that's my soapbox. That's my soapbox, sorry. So uh, this is another, this is a shorter piece. So they came to us this last year and uh, they said, oh, you know, uh, the general, we have a new general. He loves these infographics things you see on, on, on YouTube all the time and web pages. And, and they think, oh, well, we'll just, you know, we'll spend $5,000 on it. Not, no, they don't realize that you have to, you have to storyboard the whole thing. And you have to, you know, it's all, it's, just like building a, a film or a show, and you have to hire artists, and you have to hire animators, and you have to you know, put this whole story together. This, this project with approvals, because the Army is very uh, particular, this took uh, four months to make. And so it's not you know, $5,000. It's a lot more. So we gonna show you what, this, what we did here. A rewarding decision in a young American's life can be to become a soldier. Along with the training and experience, soldiers are also compensated with Army pay and other entitlements designed to serve both the soldier and their family. To ensure that you receive your Army pay, your earnings are directly deposited into an established sure pay account with a recognized financial institution of your choice. Your account must be open prior to shipping to basic training, so it is ready for deposits on your first day of service. Your guaranteed competitive base pay will be calculated depending upon your accrued time in service and increases as you are promoted. In addition to base pay, soldiers may qualify for special pay and bonuses for specific jobs and assignments. 
For soldiers who qualify, the Army will also offset the cost of living with allowances that provide for a reasonable quality of life for soldier and family. Benefits include housing allowance, sustenance allowance, cost of living allowance, and relocation allowance. No matter where your Army journey takes you, you can be confident that you and your family will be cared for with health care benefits that are second to none and one of the largest networks in the world. Service members' group life insurance is provided automatically to new soldiers through the Department of Veterans Affairs and can be modified to adjust amounts of coverage and beneficiary designation. Just as Army soldiers are Army strong, so is the Army family. To ensure that you have quality time to be with those you care about most, each and every soldier earns 30 days of vacation annually. The Army Family and Morale, Welfare and Recreation programs offer the soldier and their family a wide variety of quality services and packages for vacations, recreational services and daily activities. Qualified soldiers can take advantage of education incentives, such as tuition assistance, credentialing services and education counselor support. The Army provides top-notch services to soldiers wherever they may be assigned. Pay, allowances, bonuses, health care, education, and recreation. To learn more, log on to the Go Army website for additional information on the many benefits of Army service. So, so that it's the, uh, the yeah. The, so the so the both those were, were delivered in the last. Um, I don't know, we're delivering actually this one this next week. Uh, it's going to go on their site. But um, they uh, kind of have their own audience. They have 4,000 recruiters across the country that they handle, handle these things out to, and they, they, show, they get a lot of audience. But um, kind of getting back to my, my graphic here, um, when they ask me, you know, when they ask me to do something new, I run on three-year contracts with them. And we've been doing it so long. They've trusted us so long. We've been through probably seven or eight generals during that time, maybe more. Every time a general comes in, they want to change everything. And so we just roll the punches and keep with that upward migration. You never let them peak and go down. That's, that's the, the goal. And the, the people that we work with trust us that we will always deliver on time and on budget. And, that, and, and that's been going on since 1998. So that, that's kind of my little story in a long nutshell. <laughs> so anybody have any questions? About clients and cutting out a price, price, price the job, especially if it's new and you haven't done it before, or it's how many people. Uh, I guess I, I guess it's hard for me to answer because I've been doing this for so long. I, I pretty much know most of the people that I, that I've been friends and trust with that can do pretty much everything in, in film and, and broadcast, and so I, I know who I can go to trust, and, and they'll they'll give me a great price and a and a. And a I usually start there. I, I start with what it's going to cost me, and then I uh, work forward from there on the first job. Profit margin, uh, you know. One thing you got to remember: you're all in f you're all for profit. You're not you're not a nonprofit. That's a double negative. Sorry. Don't you, you're all you're a for profit company. So you have to take people's services, mark them up. It's okay. People, you know, it's okay. It's, they expect you. You got to make money to stay in business. You know, it's it's not. That's not rocket science. <laughs> but I how I how I bet it is. Um, uh, I put all the all the all the costs together. Then I put how much internal labor we're going to have. We have 15 employees, so I have to I have to figure out how much time they're going to put in there. And then um, I put on top our, our profit margin. Then I that's usually how I price it. Yeah. When. And this was I'm pulling stuff out of your speech that you didn't actually say. But when somebody comes to you and says, I want this video and I want it done for $5,000 or X amount of dollars, and you counter to them, do you counter with them with, this is the amount we can do it for? Or do you counter with, hmm. we suspect that this is the amount that we can do it for, but we charge by the hour? Or less. OK. <laughs> All right. Um, when I come up with a, a client that wants an X amount, so a, a set dollar amount, right? I ask them, uh, do you want a Yugo or a Ferrari? Because if you want a Yugo, we're going back dating myself, sorry. Um, uh, 
if you want to have, uh, you know, something that's going to be, that's going to run, and it's going to get you where you got to go, then that, that, it's, it's going to be in this price range. If you want it to look, like, I have enough demonstrations of products that over the years that I can show people, and I can give them ranges of what the clients spent on it. And that's usually a good gauge for people, is that you can say, well, this client paid, you know, a rent between eight and twelve thousand dollars. This client paid between, you know, fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars. You know, you don't really want to give them an exact price, but I can show them three or four different versions. I've done enough projects now, so that I can show them uh, what what they get for their money. And usually, uh, they'll understand once you show them that oh, this had a jib, this had a steady cam, this had a handheld. You know, <laughs> you know, there's a a big difference between what you can, what you get, uh, and how many people you have on the crew, and the, the 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 value you put into the product. And do you ever? I mean, when you, the experience I've had is that I give somebody an estimate, and we get, you know, two weeks into the project, and I'm on my ninth script revision, and and we still haven't started anything, and I'm already running out of the number of hours that I've estimated. Every estimate I have um, has a set amount of hours for the hourly rate, and then it says uh, plus or minus. We will actually we will charge actual hours plus or minus to this number. Every every estimate we put out has that in there. That way, and then what we do is every if they're a, it's a month long project. Every week we give them a progress report. How many? How far they're through the project? If they've been using too much of our time and. And we tell them, you're running out of time. You're going to need an extra 10, 10 hours. Then we tell them that. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. Something that happens a lot of times with newer clients, older clients that I've had for a while, I don't have to really deal with this, but with newer clients, a lot of times life can be so much easier on a production if I just know what your budget is, right? But you run into these newer clients that they, they feel like they can't tell you how much money they want to spend because you're going to charge up to, you know, you don't know how to think what the game is. Do you have any tips on how to approach that conversation and actually figure out what is your budget so I know what I can reduce? I guess it depends who the audience is. I mean, who the, who the, who the client is. Yeah. Um, the government will never tell you <laughs> unless you have a really good relationship with them. Uh, if it's a, a person that wants to really lowball and come up with a price, they'll give to tell you. It's got to be happening for $5,000 or whatever it is. Um, if I, I price it, I price it, uh, regular productions, because I have a lot, I have a big overhead. I have a 12,000 square foot facility. I've got edit bays and, and staff and crazy power bills and mortgage and everything. And I know what I have to make every month. And if I don't make that, I have to, I have to price my projects at a certain level. If they don't want to work with us, then good luck. You know, they, 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 they can go to our website, they can see our products, they can see our success stories with our clients. We try our best, but, but we, you know, unfortunately, we're now in a position now, most of my projects are in the 50000 and higher price because I can't compete anymore on the $5,000, $8,000 videos anymore um, because there's a lot of people that uh, they can hire a, a staff member, you know, um, I've lost some customers over the years. That, that's what they've done. They've hired three or four people, and they, they bought some small cameras, and they, they do their own stuff, and that's great, and that's fine. But they have kind of, we, uh, we outgrew them, or they outgrew us, I guess. Um, did I answer your question? Not quite. Not really. <laughs> okay, what's the trick? What's the trick? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's it. That it's really hard. Um, I stopped asking a long time ago um, because it puts the client in an awkward position. Uh, so what I try to do is I can I give them ranges of what I can build a program for. So if it's a, you know, if I'll show them a sample and this is the range of what you can get. Uh, I'll show them a sample. This is the range of what you can get. 
Right, right. Give them a low, medium, high. See where they feel them out. See where they feel, where they want to spend. And then that's the best I can do. I can't really do much more than that. Yes? Well, I, this is kind of an answer and also kind of a question because I don't know whether it would actually work as well for video production. But uh, in graphic design and web design, one of the things that I recognized early on before I started getting into that business was most designers didn't have a clue how to quote to a client. And most clients didn't want to tell you what their budget was because they didn't want to pay that much. So there's this dance back and forth. So what I did, I created an itemized menu of options and broke everything down by a component and then served them up a menu and they choose off of that menu. And I've done that to a minor extent with video production. I've done it a lot with this place. And once they see a price point and what Brian just said about uh, the high, medium, and low kind of a package, they see that they have a lot more respect for it. They're less willing or less interested in negotiating because it's there. You don't go to McDonald's, look at the menu, and say, I'll have a Big Mac, but I only want to pay a certain amount of dollars for it. Hmm. So if you don't have it tangibly locked down at what your price is, it leaves it wide open for the client to kind of push you around and do whatever. Yeah, I mean, we, with the, with the, most of our work is, is with military, government, California State. Um, and we have a pricing schedule that's on GSA, that's public. Um, it's, uh, we have a CMAS schedule with this California multiple award schedule. The same thing, it's, all pu it's the same pricing as GSA. So that they can go and look at and see what our individual rates are. And if they, uh, that they don't know how long it takes, how many hours it actually takes. So, yes. What's an appropriate month of time? For, for what kind of, what kind of labor? Uh, like employee labor or outsource labor? Okay. Well, everybody's profit margins are different. Um, how public is this video? <laughs> okay. Um, no, uh, usually uh, you would take a, an outsource for us. <laughs> an outsource for us would be if we were to hire someone to shoot for us, it's usually one and a half times that, that, that rate. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb to go with. Um, one of the, the things that, uh, that's kept me in business so long is, the other thing I didn't probably should have put on there is, don't overcharge. Never overcharge. Right. You want, them, you want to give them a great product for a good price. If they, they, they feel that they got a great product, a good price, they're always going to come back. But the challenge is getting them, getting those customers. That's the I have, a, I have a question. Yes. Um, you were talking about trust earlier um, in developing that, that level of, of trust with your customer. Uh, could you bring up a couple more uh, points that you have found uh, work well? Is it camaraderie? Is it friendliness? How do you, how do you develop that trust? Um, I have lived by a my business uh, ethics have been based upon what's called servant leadership, where I believe that, and so it's an old adage, you know, you, you treat people how you want to be treated. You want to, you serve people how you want to be served. It's not a servant, you're not their servant, you're, you're, but it, you serve people the way you want to be served. If you, you will get out, out just, you'll get out just more, you'll get more back from what you put out. It's like volunteering. You know, if you volunteer at a homeless shelter or whatever and you don't get paid, and I've raised my kids since they were real small to do this, they, they get ten times more out of volunteering than they ever did, you know, for working for somebody. Because you just get that much more back. That's, a, that's the trust. When you work with someone, you help someone out, you do them a favor, um, it's an unspoken uh, relationship, trust type of thing. So it sounds like being yourself and being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Is really the answer, right? You can't. Uh, there's, you can't fake uh, yourself. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You, you can't. You can't put a persona out there and act at a, a, to a new group of people because you can't keep it up. You can't keep up that story. You just you put it out there who you are, and they'll accept you for who you are, or not. Yes. So let's say you have a long time client and something happens and they move out of that box and start onto the, the downward migration path. What do you do to recover um, from that? Pretty much try anything. If 
<laughs> um, you, uh, and it usually happens when they change management, a uh, new CEO, um, a new, you know, something else comes in. You have to, uh, I know some of you, I think, worked for Qualcomm over the years and here and stuff. Um, we worked for them, gosh, for a good 12, 13 years. And then they had new management come in and everything changed and, you know, we're doing something else. Okay, see ya. You know, I tried everything. I tried, we'll do this, we'll do that. And it's like, no, Ryan, we still like you, but the management wants to go this way and you guys go that way. So that's just, it just happens. Um, but you can uh, do it, if it becomes price, you can offer um, new products and services at a discounted rate. That's kind of sometimes I do that. I'll, we have a product called vForum, and uh, that's a whole other topic as well, but it's a, it's a app on your phone that we've written that combines video and PowerPoint. And you can do it yourself, you can shoot it yourself, you can do everything yourself, and it's all on your phone, synchronized, and it's secure and, and all that. And the Army uses it, and I've got all kinds of big, big customers using it. And I, because it's something I made, it's something that's internal, it's a low-cost product, I'll, I'll give that away the first time. I'll give them something to try new technology. Um, that's what I do because I have those resources. Uh, but you have to, you have, when they're on their downward migration and you're kind of starting to feel that they're going away, uh, you hit your, you, know, you rely on those relationships that you've made with the people to go back and talk to them, go out to lunch with them. You know, you try to get them back. But so, if it's new management, they may be forced out of it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the hard part is getting new clients. I'm just curious what kind of processes your company has to do that. Um, because I have to have larger clients, uh, it takes longer. It takes a lot longer. <laughs> it takes a, uh, I, I've been working on this one project for the Marine Corps for three years, and I just got the shoot this month. That's how long it's taken me to, to do that. And so, um, with it just took that long to get their trust. Is that meetings back and forth, or proposals being thrown back and it's, forth, script writing, everything? It's uh, a combination of everything. It's it's a lot of meetings, a lot of getting to know people. What happens in the military is everybody moves every two years. So you're working with a colonel one time, and he loves your stuff. He's gone to the East Coast, or he's going to Bahrain or whatever and you're you got another person coming in and you got to start over and so you just start over with the, the same you know uh, trying to get the trust established um, but finding new business uh, I'm sorry your, your question again finding new business just want to know like what kind of processes you guys use right like sales team. Um, I have one salesperson and myself that's pretty much what we do um, I do all the government work he does all the commercial stuff We've had really good success with the San Diego Chamber of Commerce. If you want to, uh, they have a lot of really good meetings, and they have a really uh, some really neat networking classes you can take for free. Um, we joined uh, again uh, last December, and uh, we've been meeting a lot more people. Uh, some for some from some of their events. Uh, we've got a couple small pieces here and there projects, but nothing big. But you know, it's something that you have to take a long time to do. Yeah. We, I mean, just off of what you're saying. Yeah, referrals are pretty much everything for us. Uh, how that's how we get our business. Um, Jobs from Northern California, just based off of another client mm -hmm. liking us. Yeah, and that's uh, because we have the government contracts in place. We're, we're able to go to other people and say, "Hey, you can if you have cash, you can write on this contract over here. You just got to transfer the money over." And uh, and that's government is not commercial at all, right? It's a whole different world. But the, from a commercial standpoint, um, I do, uh, it's all networking stuff. It's, it's local, uh, San Diego Chamber, uh, local chamber up in Carlsbad, we, we do. Um, and then it's uh, associations like this, but associations that you may have an interest in. If, you're, if you like numbers, you want to go to the CFO one. If you're a marketing specialist, you want to join the marketing one. If you want to do uh, training, you join ASTD. So there's all these associations that meet. You just, you just got to go and start going to meetings and meeting people and be yourself. 
and, and you'll make friends, and then eventually you'll get customers from it. That's how I do it. There's no magic pill for getting a new customer. You've got such a bright, sweet personality. <laughs> there you go. So, anything else? okay. There you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, Brian, sorry. Thank you. Um, do we have any other rounds of uh, questions about media buying? Um, I could pose uh, another question for Rod um, that I think uh, some of us may have fallen into. Uh, you get a new customer, it's a commercial client, and they think they're going to go to the cable company themselves and make the buy. And they're just going to call up. Um, number one, how might you head them off in order to, uh, as you're building trust, uh, that you would be able to manage their, their media buy for you. And then uh, you, you went through some of these things, but maybe a, a, another, go back through the other laundry list of traditional media and digital also as you now sell this new customer that you can manage their media. Uh, those are two separate things, kind of, but... Um I just had that happen with a, a client I have in Erie, and he said to me, I was on that downward slide because I have a media buyer who once a month will talk to my clients, and that's about it. But I used to all the time call him and talk to him and email him, and so I was on a downward pitch with this guy. And he said to me, why can't I just go to the cable station and talk to Paula and uh, just have her come over, and I can buy the same thing you can? And I said, that's true, you can. But what I can do that you can't do is spend the time to do it. First of all, you've got a business to run. I do this every day for a living. And I can get the prices better than you can and still be paid in it, so it's not going to cost you anything. I mean, in a, in a diplomatic way, you say these things. But the bottom line is, he can't do what I can do. And you have to convince him of that in a nice and friendly way. And I used to stay at this guy's house. I mean, we are good friends. But at the same time, I'm going to lose this guy. So what I did is he said, I think maybe you could get, get your rates cheaper. And I said, I, I'll do my best. I couldn't. I found out that I was at the bottom line. But he has a friend in his market that says he's getting it cheaper. So what I said was, I'll buy your, and this is the first time I've ever done this. I said, I'll buy your time for you at 10%. And I know that extra money will make more than make up for what you think I'm paying extra for. He emailed me back and said, I don't want you to cut your rate. I don't want a, a cut rate. I want the best service. Since then, I've emailed him almost every day. Today, he called me and thanked me for all that I'm doing for him, even though I'm not doing any more for him than I was doing before. I'm still doing the same great job I did before, but I saved that client. Your next was traditional versus uh, digital. list of where you can place media, and uh, you went through some of them. Could you just remind us of what they were? Television, radio. Well, yeah, you've got, yeah, the, the, well, the, here's another issue you've got to fight right now with clients and digital. Um, everybody thinks digital is the panacea to your advertising woes. It is not. It will coexist with traditional, and they will always both be there. Nothing will speak louder than this uh, uh, example. Two years ago, I'm watching the Super Bowl, and I see the K900 Kia introduced. I went, wow. Cool, I've never seen one of these before. I pulled out my laptop. 90% of these searches now are done on phones, but my eyes aren't that great. I pulled up my laptop, I went to the internet, searched K900. I immediately went to, was taken to, Team Kia's website, which is a half a mile from my office. I'm on there, I'm searching, I'm looking, wow, this is pretty cool, really cool. Two weeks later, my wife goes to Team Kia. Now, had we didn't buy, had we bought a car, where do you think that dealership would have given the credit for that sale? The internet, because she came there from the internet. TV, my couch on my TV took me to the internet. They had a good digital presence. They took me to their dealership and took my wife over there to shop for a key night. That's the way it works. So digital has to be stimulated. If I hold a piece of paper up to your face, Brian, and say, D Google what you see, you're going to say, what, the paper? No, there's nothing on the paper. So you have to stimulate a search. There's a sales funnel that starts with, at the top, with, um, you're just, you're very, you're passive. You don't really know you're looking for a car or you just kind of, you know, in that little area. That's where traditional media feeds you. You got to build a franchise in your mind. Some of you in here are old enough to remember Winston tastes good like a, 
cigarettes should. McDonald's, you deserve a break today. They built this franchise in your mind. Kleenex is a product. It's not a, 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 a you don't write down face, facial tissue on your shopping list. You put Kleenex. You know, uh, Xerox this for me. Well, that's not a verb. It's a product. So you have to build a franchise in your mind. The way you do that is with intrusive media, radio, television, Pandora. Even though Pandora is digital and YouTube videos, even though they're digital, they're still intrusive. You didn't ask for them. Intrusive is not an ugly word. It just means you didn't ask for this advertisement. It happened to you. And that's what builds your interest in the K900 or whatever it is that you just saw. Now you go digital and you buy. So building a franchise in your mind with traditional media will always be there, and you have to stimulate digital. I had a Ford store that went to a Ford dealership meeting in Nevada, in Las Vegas, and a third-party speaker got in there, just like you and me, one of these clowns, and said, go back to your, de your dealerships and cancel everything. Take all your traditional media, throw it away, go 100% digital. What a stupid thing to tell somebody. And I had my dealer call me and say, what do you think about that? I said, well... That's fine if everybody's a buy today, but it, you, like, you can't, you have, well, it, it's frustrating to me because they actually believe that this is going to work. Now, Ford is going with 50% of your budget now. They're going to they're gonna co-op you if you go digital. So they're kind of forcing that issue. But you still have to stimulate digital. What else, Tom? Yes. How do you value things? For example, I'll give you my sincere example. Like, I'm starting, uh, I already have a television series, but now we're starting radio show, and um, we know we're going to start out at 25,000 and build it to 100,000 in a year and stuff like that. But how do you, when, you, when you're talking about an hour-long radio show on, let's say, a destination, how, how would you go about valuing that? Like for the destination, not that we're charging the destination, but uh, like maybe a hotel that wants to advertise and stuff like that, because it's, uh, instead of just being a car commercial in a Super Bowl, because you can't go watch the football not to buy a car, um, unless it's a Super Bowl, I guess. Uh, uh, but in this case, you're actually listening to an hour show on that destination. So then if you're motivated to go to that destination, it's a really uh, targeted for that hotel or that restaurant or that tour for that destination. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. <laughs> you have to build value in, the, in, the, in an hour show. You have to convince Brian that you have something that the people that – you're selling this to is going to want to see. You have to prove it, though. It's like Arbitron or Nielsen, um, and you, you, Mr. Is it Tom, or what was your name? I'm sorry. Mike, I'm sorry. Ask before, how do you prove it? Well, there's an affidavit, like to answer your question from before, uh, when we get bills, we get affidavits with those from the TV station that says these actually ran. And, you know, there's proof there. But when you're trying to sell air and you don't have anything other than goodwill to sell, it's a good luck. Oh, know, no, no, I'm just saying, if, uh, let's say we have 100,000 listeners. Okay. okay. And it's, uh, this week it's going to be a show on Lake Tahoe. And we're going to sell an ad, uh, we're offering an ad to a hotel for a 30-second spot. How would you value that differently than, let's say, it's just some, uh, some show, random show, uh, on car repair to a hotel in, uh, in Lake Tahoe? Obviously... Yeah. You know, since you're talking about the destination, it's much more targeted, and it's going to really pique people's interest to go to Lake Tahoe, and then a hotel's a natural thing to go to, where a car show it wouldn't be a natural thing to book a hotel. And, uh, Lake Tahoe. I might be able to add something to this. Yeah. Um, I, my company produced a web show for about three years that was a very niche audience. Um, and as far as, if the question is, how much should I charge the, the advertiser? What it comes down to is charge what they'll pay. I mean, we sat down and we said, we think that a pre-roll on this show is worth this much. And then we went to advertisers and pitched to them. Um, and honestly, in the end, I think we undervalued it a little bit. Um, so maybe my advice is figure out what you want to charge them and then move it up a little bit. And, and, and go tell them. That's what you want. That's what you well, want you for your spot. You can yeah, you know, figure out what you want to make. If you have four spots in an hour, how many, you know, and you need to, and you're paying for the airtime of 
400 bucks, you're going to need 1,000 bucks to make any money. So divide it by four and say, this is what it costs. I mean, you can't go broke. You've got to make a living. I don't know. Yes? Do you do nothing with targeted stuff for each show, or do you do like run of schedule, you know, run of day, or night? The, the issue or the question was run of schedule or target specific shows. On cable, we'll do both. Uh, generally, on cable, what we'll do is, is buy a 6 to midnight, but I'd never buy a 6 a.m. to midnight. I mean, 6 p. to midnight, or a 10 to, to 6, a 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., or little blocks, prime time, 6 to 10 p.m. Uh, and then we'll buy specific shows, too, Anarchy, uh, you, you, you know, you, the Pawn Stars, and, and uh, name, name it, we'll buy those individual shows as well. Broadcast TV, I never buy run of schedule. Uh, always, well, I, I take that back. Every now and then we'll buy an ROS in the afternoon on ABC. How about long form? Infomercial time. Late night stuff. Infomercial stuff, we don't do anything with. On TV, you just go with the facility. Yes, because you can take a. Uh, TV used to be just the four networks, and now they've actually made it a lot easier because everything is so targeted. If I want men, I buy ESPN. If I want women, I buy Lifetime, and you can multiply each one of those by. 30 because there's so many cable shows. So what's better? More 15 second commercials or less or less 30 second commercials? We do both. Uh, on 15 second spots, we do bookends. So if a TV station is going to charge me an easy number, 100 bucks for a 30, I, ch I get 100 bucks for two 15s. So it's the same amount of money, but with the DVR situation happening the way it is now, all the dealers will say, well, I'll just skip through them. Yeah, well, not everybody does, but some people do. So if you buy bookends, well, as soon as the program goes into a break, you're first. So by the time I reach over here and get the remote, I've got my five seconds. Alexander Fort, you already heard it. So now you're, now you're skipping, right? And as soon as you see programming, you hit stop, and it backs up eight seconds, and you hear the last part of the leather spot. So that's the way we're, we're getting around the DVR thing. Plus, we don't buy a whole lot of programming that is DVRable. I mean, if you buy news, if you buy sports, I don't want to watch the Charger game when it's over. I already know the score. Somebody at the airport is going to tell me on my way home, I know it. And it's happened so many times. So uh, I, 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 in 30s, you know, you're going to pay the same amount of money for a 30 as you do two 15s. The 15s, you can't say a lot in, so it's basically a quick branding. The 30s, you can actually tell a little bit of a story and, you know, do well. ROS spots, uh, back to that question, are a lot cheaper than individual spots. If I want to buy The Voice, it's going to cost me 1000 bucks. If I want to buy 6 p.m. till midnight, it's going to cost me 700 I might fall in The Voice, but probably not. That's why it's cheaper, because you're not getting really what you want. <laughs> you're getting what they're going to give you. Anything else? Let's have a beer. Yeah, exactly. There's a little bit left in the back there. Uh, well, I want to thank Rod Hunter and Brian Douglas for a wonderful uh, presentation. I feel smarter. And our next meeting is the NAB wrap-up. Um, April 22nd, uh, we're going to have a little bit of extra talk about various cameras uh, that are on the market right now. And then... Um, various reports on what's going on in Las Vegas this year. And one other question. I'm hoping to have, because I'm the one that's running that next meeting, I'm hoping to have yes. reps from a couple of different companies to come in and talk about their stuff, but quite honestly, it's been a little bit difficult to get a hold of them. I do have a little JV Sanders committed. Um, but if anybody has a contact with a um, uh, camera manufacturer, and wants to share it, all, all we're asking for them to do is show up and, and talk about their camera. We're not charging them a vendor's fee. It's um, just show up and, and share. If you, if you have contact with any of, of these companies, Panasonic, Sony, uh, Blackmagic, Canon, uh, Avid, or Adobe, please send me an email, vp at sdmediapros.org with that contact info, because all of, all of those people have changed. I don't know who they are anymore. Um, so those are the people that I'm trying to get to come. Right now I've got uh, JVC. The rest of them I'm carrying nothing but crickets from them. And it's probably because they're all really, really busy getting ready for this. But worst case scenario, if that doesn't happen, I'm going to NAB. I'll come back with all the information that I have. Bring all that bag of brochures with you and uh, don't just leave it under the bed and find it for you. <laughs>
All right, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate you coming out. We'll see you next time. Okay. What, what, one more. Oh, what, what? I know this has been a really fast meeting, so if, if any of you need to talk about more media buying stuff, just go to rodhunter.com. Just use my name. Just rodhunter.com. It'll take you to our website. Get a phone number. Give me a call. I'll be glad to talk to any of you. No problem. Yes, Rod will help you out. Thank you. <laughs>